Chapter Thirteen of the Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Witch of Prague a fantastic tale by francis marion crawford chapter thirteen unorna was superstitious as keyork arabian had once told her she did not thoroughly understand herself and she had very real comprehension of the method by which she produced such remarkable results she was gifted with a sensitive and active imagination which supplied her with semi-mystic formulae of thought and speech in place of reasoned explanations and she undoubtedly attributed much of her own power to supernatural influences in this respect at least she was no farther advanced than the witches of older days and if her inmost convictions took a shape which would have seemed incomprehensible to those predecessors of hers this was to be attributed in part to the innate superiority of her nature and partly also to the high degree of cultivation in which her mental faculties had reached development keyork arabian might spend hours in giving her learned explanations of what she did but he never convinced her possibly he was not convinced himself and he still hesitated perhaps between the two great theories advanced to explain the phenomena of hypnotism he had told her that he considered her influence to be purely a moral one exerted by means of language and supported by her extraordinary concentrated will but it did not follow that he believed what he told her and it was not improbable that he might have his own doubts on the subject doubts which unorna was not slow to suspect and which destroyed for her the whole force of his reasoning she fell back upon a sort of grossly unreasonable mysticism combined with a blind relief in those hidden natural forces and secret virtues of privileged objects which formed the nucleus of medieval scientific research the field is a fertile one for the imagination and possesses a strange attraction for certain minds there are men alive in our own time to whom the transmutation of metal does not seem an impossibility nor the brewing of the excelsior of life a matter to be scoffed at as a matter of course the world is full of people who in their inmost selves put faith in the latent qualities of precious stones and amulets who believe their fortunes their happiness and their lives to be directly influenced by some trifling object which they have always upon them we do not know enough to state with assurance that the constant handling of any particular metal or gem may not produce a real and invariable corresponding effect upon the nerves but we do know most positively that when the belief in such talismans is once firmly established the moral influence they exert upon men through the imagination is enormous from this condition of mind to that in which auguries are drawn from outward and apparently accidental circumstances is but a step if keyork arabian inclined to the psychic rather than to the, the physical school in his view of unorna's witchcraft and in his studies of hypnotism in general his opinion resulted naturally from his great knowledge of mankind and of the unacknowledged often unsuspected convictions which in realty direct mankind's activity it was this experience too and the certainty to which it had led him 
that put him beyond the reach of unarna's power so long as he chose not to yield himself to her will her position was in reality diametrically opposed to his and although he repeated his reasonings to her from time to time he was quite indifferent to the nature of her views and never gave himself any real trouble to make her change them the important point was that she should not lose anything of the gifts she possessed and keyork was wise enough to see that the exercise of them depended in a great measure upon her own convictions regarding their exceptional nature urona herself believed in everything which strengthened and developed that conviction and especially in the influences of time and place it appeared to her a fortunate circumstance when she at last determined to overcome her pride that the resolution should have formed itself exactly a month after she had so successfully banished the memory of beatrice from the mind of the man she loved she felt sure of producing a result as effectual if this time she could work the second change in the same place and under the same circumstances as the first and to this end everything was in her favour she needed not to close her eyes to fancy that thirty days had not really passed between then and now as she left her house in the afternoon with the wanderer by her side he had come back and had found her once more herself calm collected conscious of her own powers no suspicion of the real cause of the disturbance he had witnessed crossed his mind still less could he guess what thing she meditated as she directed their walk towards that lonely place by the river which had been the scene of her first great effort she talked lightly as they went and he in that strange humour of peaceful well-satisfied indifference which possessed him answered her in the same strain it was yet barely afternoon but there was already a foretaste of coming events in the chilly air i have been thinking of what you said this morning she said suddenly changing the current of the conversation did i thank you for your kindness she smiled as she laid her hand gently upon his arm to cross a crowded street and she looked up into his quiet face thank me for what on the contrary i fancy that i had annoyed you perhaps i did not quite understand it all at first she answered thoughtfully it is hard for a woman like me to realize the what it would be like to have a brother or a sister or any one belonging to me i need to think of the idea do you know that i am quite alone in the world the wanderer had accepted her as he found her strangely alone indeed and strangely independent of the world a beautiful singularity interesting woman doing good so far as he knew in her own way separated from ordinary existence by some unusual circumstances and elevated above ordinary dangers by the strength and the pride of her own character and yet indolent and indifferent as he had grown of late he was conscious of a vague curiosity in regard to her story keyork either really knew nothing or pretended to know nothing of her origin i see that you are alone said the wanderer have you always been so always i have had an odd life you could not understand it if i told you of it and yet i have been lonely too and i believe i was once unhappy though i cannot think of any reason for it you have been lonely yes but yours was another loneliness more limited less fatal more voluntary it must seem strange to you i do not even positively know of what nation i was born her companion looked at her in surprise and his curiosity increased i know nothing of myself she continued i remember neither father nor mother i grew up in the forest 
among people who did not love me but who taught me and respected me as though i were their superior and who sometimes feared me when i look back i am amazed at their learning and their wisdom and ashamed of having learned so little you are unjust to yourself unorna laughed no one ever accused me of that she said would you believe it i do not even know where that place was i cannot tell you even the name of the kingdom in which it lay i learned a name for it and for the forest but those names are in no map that has ever fallen into my hands i sometimes feel that i would go to the place if i could find it it is very strange and how came you here i was told the time had come we started at night it was a long journey and i remember feeling tired as i was never tired before or since they brought me here they left me in a religious house among nuns then i was told that i was rich and free my fortune was brought with me that at least i know but those who received it and who took care of it for me know no more of its origin than i myself gold tells no tales and the secret has been well kept i would give much to know the truth when i am in the humour she sighed and then laughed again you see why it is that i find the idea of a brother so hard to understand she added and then was silent you have all the more need of understanding it my dear friend the wanderer answered looking at her thoughtfully yes perhaps so i can see what friendship is i can almost guess what it would be to have a brother and have you never thought of more than that he asked the question in his calmest and most friendly tone somewhat deferentially as though fearing lest it should seem tactless and be unwelcome yes i have thought of love also she answered in a low voice but she said nothing more and they walked on for some time in silence they came up upon the open place by the river which she remembered so well your norna glanced about her and her face fell the place was the same but the solitude was disturbed it was not sunday as it had been on that day a month ago all about the huge blocks of stone groups of workmen were busy with great chisels and heavy hammers hewing and chipping and fashioning the material that it might be ready for use in the early spring even the river was changed men were standing upon the ice cutting it into long symmetrical strips to be hauled ashore some of the great pieces were already separated from the main ice and sturdy fellows clad in dark woolen were poling them over the dark water to the foot of the gently sloping road where the heavy cart stood ready to receive the load when cut up into blocks the dark city was taking in a great provision of its own coldness against the summer months unorna looked about her everywhere there were people at work and she was more disappointed than she would own to herself at the invasion of the solitude the wanderer looked from the stone cutters to the ice men with a show of curiosity i have not seen so much life in prague for many a day he observed let us go answered unorna nervously i do not like it i cannot bear the sight of people to-day they turned in a new direction unorna guiding her companion by a gesture they were near to the jewish quarter and presently were threading their way through the narrow and filthy streets thronged with eager hebrew faces and filled with the hum of low-pitched voices chattering together not in the language of the country but in the base dialect of german they were in the heart of prague in that dim quarter which is one of the strongholds of the israelite whence he directs great enterprises and sets in motion huge financial schemes in which israel sits as a great spider in the midst of a dark web 
dominating the whole capital with his eagle glance and weaving the destiny of the bohemian people to suit his intricate speculations for throughout the length and breadth of the slavonic and german austria the jew rules and rules alone unorna gathered her furs more closely about her in evident disgust at her surroundings but still she kept on her way her companion scarcely less familiar with the sights of prague than she herself walked by her side glancing carelessly at the passing people at the hebrew signs at the dark entrances that led to courts within courts and into labyrinths of dismal lanes and passages looking at everything with the same serene indifference and idly wondering what made unorna choose to walk that way then he saw that she was going towards the cemetery they reached the door were admitted and found themselves alone in the vast wilderness in the midst of the city lies the ancient burial ground now long disused but still undisturbed many acres of uneven land covered so thickly with graves and planted so closely with granite and sandstone slabs that the paths will scarce allow two persons to walk side by side the stones stand and lie in all conceivable positions erect slanting at every angle prostrate upon the earth or upon others already fallen before them two three and even four upon a grave where generations of men have been buried one upon the other stone large and small covered with deep-cut inscriptions in the hebrew character bearing the sculpture of two uplifted hands wherever the cones the children of the tribe of aaron are laid to rest or the gracefully chiselled ewer of the levites here they lie thousands upon thousands of dead jews great and small rich and poor wise and ignorant neglected individually but guarded as a whole with all the tenacious determination of the race to hold its own and to preserve the sacredness of its dead in the dim light of the winter's afternoon it is as though a great army of men had fallen fighting there and had been turned to stone as they fell rank upon rank they lie with that irregularity which comes of symmetry destroyed like columns and files of soldiers shot down in the act of advancing and in winter the grey light falling upon the untrodden snow throws a pale reflection upwards against each stone as though from the myriad sepulchres a faintly luminous vapour were rising to the outer air over all the rugged brushwood and the stunted trees intertwined their leafless branches and twigs in a thin ghostly network of grey that clouds the view of the farther distance without interrupting it a forest of shadowy skeletons clasping restless bony hands one with the other from grave to grave as far as the eye can see the stillness in the place is intense not a murmur of distant life from the surrounding city disturbs the silence at rare intervals a strong breath of icy wind stirs the dead branches and makes them crack and rattle against the gravestones and against each other as in a dance of death it is a wild and dreary place in the summer indeed the thick leafage lends it a transitory colour and softness but in the depths of winter when there is nothing to hide the nakedness of truth when the snow lies thick upon the ground and the twined twigs and twisted trunks scarce cast a tracery of shadow under the sunlit sky the utter desolation and loneliness of the spot have a horror of their own not to be described but never to be forgotten unorna walked forward in silent choosing a path so narrow that her companion found himself obliged to drop behind and follow in her footsteps in the wildest part of this wilderness of death there is a little rising of the ground 
here both the gravestones and the stunted trees are thickest and the solitude is if possible even more complete than elsewhere as she reached the highest point unorna stood still turned quickly towards the wanderer and held out both her hands towards him i have chosen this place because it is quiet she said with a soft smile hardly knowing why he did so he laid his hand in hers and looked kindly down to her upturned face what is it he asked meeting her eyes she was silent and her fingers did not unclasp themselves he looked at her and saw for the hundredth time that she was very beautiful there was a faint colour in her cheeks and her full lips were just parted as though a loving word had escaped them which she would not willingly recall against the background of broken neutral tints her figure stood out an incarnation of youth and vitality if she had often looked weary and pale of late her strength and freshness had returned to her now in all their abundance the wanderer knew that he was watching her and knew that he was thinking of her beauty and realizing the whole extent of it more fully than ever before but beyond this point his thoughts could not go he was aware that he was becoming fascinated by her eyes and he felt that with every moment it was growing harder for him to close his own or to look away from her and then an instant later he knew that it would be impossible yet he made no effort he was passive indifferent willless and her gaze charmed him more and more he was already in a dream and he fancied that the beautiful figure shone with a soft rosy light of its own in the midst of the gloomy waste looking into her sun-like eyes he saw their twin images of himself that drew him softly and surely into themselves until he was absorbed by them and felt that he was no longer a reality but a reflection then a deep unconsciousness stole over his senses and he slept or passed into that state which seemed to lie between sleep and trance unorna needed not to question him this time for she saw that he was completely under her influence yet she hesitated at the supreme moment and then though to all real intents she was quite alone a burning flush of shame rose to her face and her heart sank within her she felt that she could not do it she dropped his hands they fell to his sides as though they had been of lead then she turned from him and pressed her aching forehead against a tall weather-worn stone that rose higher than her own height from the midst of the hillock her woman's nature rebelled against the trick it was the truest thing in her and perhaps the best which protested so violently against the thing she meant to do it was the simple longing to be loved for her own sake and of a man's own free will to be loved by him with the love that she had despised in israel kafka but would this be love at all this artificial creation of her suggestion reacting upon his mind would it last would it be true faithful tender above all would it be real even for a moment she asked herself a thousand questions in a second of time then the ready excuse flashed upon her the pretext which the heart will always find when it must have its way was it not possible after all that he was beginning to love her even now might not that outburst of friendship which had surprised her and wounded her so deeply be the herald of a stronger passion she looked up quickly and met his vacant stare do you love me she asked almost before she knew what she was going to say no the answer came in a far-off voice that told of his unconsciousness a mere toneless monosyllable breathed upon the murky air but it stabbed her like a thrust of a jagged knife a long silence followed and unorna leaned against the great slab of carved sandstone 
even to her there was something awful in his powerless motionless presence the noble face pale and set as under a mask the thoughtful brow the dominating feature were not those of a man to be a plaything to the will of a woman the commanding figure towered in the grim surroundings like a dark statue erect unmoving and in no way weak and yet she knew that she had but to speak and the figure would move the lips would form words the voice would reach her ear he would raise his hand or that step forward or backward at her command affirm what she bid him affirm and deny whatever she chose to hear denied for a moment she wished that he had been as keyork arabian stronger than she then with a half-conscious comparison the passion for the man himself surged up and drowned every other thought she almost forgot that for a time he was not to be counted among the living she went to him and clasped her hands upon his shoulder and looked up into his scarce seeing eyes you must love me she said you must love me because i love you so will you not love me dear i have waited so long for you the soft words vibrated in his sleeping ear but drew forth neither acknowledgment nor response like a marble statue he stood still and she leaned upon his shoulder do you not hear me she cried in a more passionate tone do you not understand me why is it that your love is so hard to win look at me might not any man be proud to love me am i not beautiful enough for you and yet i know that i am fair or are you ashamed because people call me a witch why then i will never be one again for your sake what do i care for it all can it be anything to me can anything have worth that stands between me and you ah oh, love be not so very hard the wanderer did not move his face was as calm as a sculptured stone do you despise me for loving you she asked again with a sudden flush no i do not despise you something in her tone had pierced through his stupor and found an answer she started at the sound of his voice it was as though he had been awake and had known the weight of what she had been saying and her anger rose at the cold reply no you do not despise me and you never shall she exclaimed passionately you shall love me as i love you i will it with all my will we are created to be all one to the other and you shall not break through the destiny of love love me as i love you love me with all your heart love me with all your mind love me with all your soul love me as a man never loved woman since the world began i will it i command it it shall be as i say you dare not disobey me you cannot if you would she paused but this time no answer came there was not even a contraction of the stony features do you hear all i say she asked i hear then understand and answer me she said i do not understand i cannot answer you must you shall i will have it so you cannot resist my will and i will it with all my might you have no will you are mine your body your soul and your thoughts and you must love me with them all from now on until you die until you die she repeated fiercely again he was silent she felt that she had no hold upon his heart or mind seeing that he was not even disturbed by her repeated efforts are you a stone that you do not know what love is she cried grasping his hand in hers and looking with desperate eyes into his face i do not know what love is he answered slowly then i will tell you what love is she said and she took his hand and pressed it upon her own brow the wanderer started at the touch as though he would have drawn back but she held him fast and so far at least he was utterly subject to her his brow contracted darkly and his face grew paler 
read it there she cried enter into my soul and read what love is in his own great writing read how he steals suddenly into the sacred place and makes it his and tears down the old gods and sets up his dear image in their stead read how he sighs and speaks and weeps and loves and forgives not but will be revenged at the last are you indeed of stone and have you a stone for a heart love can melt even stones being said in a man is the great central fire in the earth to burn the hardest things to streams of liquid flame and see again how very soft and gentle he can be see how i love you see how sweet it is how very lovely a thing it is to love as a woman can there have you felt it now have you seen into the depths of my soul and into the hiding places of my heart let it be so in your own then and let it be so forever you understand now you know what it all is how wild how passionate how gentle and how great take to yourself this love of mine is it not all yours take it and plant it with strong roots and seeds of undying life in your own sleeping breast and let it grow and grow till it is even greater than it was in me till it takes us both into itself together fast bound in its immortal bonds to be two in one in life and beyond life for ever and ever and ever to the end of ends she ceased and he saw that his face was no longer expressionless and cold a strange light was upon his features the passing radiance of a supreme happiness seen in the vision of a dream again she laid her hands upon his shoulder clasped together as she had done at first she knew that her words had touched him and she was confident of the result confident as one who loves beyond reason already in imagination she fancied him returning to consciousness not knowing that he had slept but waking with a gentle word just trembling upon his lips the word she longed to hear one moment more she thought it was good to see that light upon his face to fancy how that first word would sound to feel that the struggle was past and that there was nothing but happiness in the future full overflowing overwhelming reaching from earth to heaven and through time to eternity one moment only before she let him wake it was such glory to be loved at last still the light was there still that exquisite smile was on his lips and they would be always there now she thought at last she spoke then love since you are mine and i am yours wake from the dream to life itself wake not knowing that you have slept knowing only that you love me now and always wake love wake she waved her delicate hand before his eyes and still resting the other upon his shoulder watched the returning brightness in the dark pupils that had been glazed and fixed a moment before and as she looked her own beauty grew radiant in the splendor of a joy even greater than she had dreamed of as it had seemed to him when he had lost himself in her gaze so now she also fancied that the grim gray wilderness was full of a soft rosy light the place of the dead was become the place of life the great solitude was peopled as the whole world could never be for her the crumbling gravestones were turned to polished pillars in the temple of an immortal love and the ghostly leafless trees blossomed with the undying flowers of the earthly paradise one moment only and then all was gone the change came sure swift and cruel as she looked it came gradual in that it passed through every degree but sudden also as the fall of a fair and mighty building which being undermined in its foundations passes in one short minute through the change from perfect completeness to hopeless and utter ruin 
all the radiance all the light all the glory were gone in an instant her own supremely loving look had not vanished her lips still parted sweetly as forming the word that was to answer his and the calm indifferent face of a waking man was already before her what is it he asked in his kind and passionless voice what were you going to ask me unorna it was gone the terrible earnest appeal had been in vain not a trace of that short vision of love remained impressed upon his brain with a smothered cry of agony unorna leaned against the great slab of stone behind her and covered her eyes the darkness of night descended upon her and with it the fire of a burning shame then a loud and cruel laugh rang through the chilly air such a laugh as the devils in hell bestow upon the shame of a proud soul that knows its own infinite bitterness unorna started and uncovered her eyes her suffering changed in a single instant to ungovernable and destroying anger she made a step forwards and then stopped short breathing hard the wanderer too had turned more quickly than she between two tall gravestones not a dozen paces away stood a man with a haggard face and eyes on fire his keen worn features contorted by a smile in which unspeakable satisfaction struggled for expression with a profound despair the man was israel kafka end of chapter thirteen Chapter 14 of The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angelique G. Campbell. The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale. By Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 14 the wanderer looked from unorna to kafka with profound surprise he had never seen the man and had no means of knowing who he was still less of guessing what had brought him to the lonely place or why he had broken into a laugh of which the harsh wild tones still echoed through the wide cemetery totally unconscious of all that had happened to himself during the preceding quarter of an hour the wanderer was deprived of the key to the situation he only understood that the stranger was for some reason or other deeply incensed against unorna and he realized that the intruder had on the moment of appearance no control over himself israel kafka remained where he stood between the two tall stones one hand resting on each his body inclined a little forward his dark sunken eyes bloodshot and full of a turbid angry brightness bent intently upon unorna's face he looked as though he were about to move suddenly forwards but it was impossible to foresee that he might not as suddenly retreat as a lean and hungry tiger crouches for a moment in uncertainty whether to fight or fly when after tracking down his man he finds him not alone and defenceless as he had anticipated but well armed and in company the wanderer's indolence was only mental and was moreover transitory and artificial when he saw unorna advance he quickly placed himself between her and israel kafka and looked from one to the other who is this man what does he want of you unorna made as though to pass him but he laid his hand upon her arm with a gesture that betrayed his anxiety for her safety at his touch her face changed for a moment and a faint blush dyed her cheek you may well ask who i am said the moravian speaking in a voice half choked with passion and anger she will tell you she does not know me she will deny my existence to my face but she knows me very well i am israel kafka the wanderer looked at him more curiously he remembered what he had heard but a few hours earlier from keyork concerning the young fellow's madness the situation now partially explained itself i understand he said looking at unorna he seems to be dangerous what shall i do with him 
he asked the question as calmly as though it had referred to the disposal of an inanimate object instead of to the taking into custody of a madman do with me cried kafka advancing suddenly a step forwards from between the slabs do with me do you speak of me as though i were a dog a dumb animal but i will he choked and coughed and could not finish the sentence there was a hectic flush in his cheek and his thin graceful frame shook violently from head to foot unable to speak for a moment he waved his hand in a menacing gesture the wanderer shook his head rather sadly he seems very ill he said in a tone of compassion but unorna was pitiless she knew what her companion could not know namely that kafka must have followed them through the streets to the cemetery and must have overheard unorna's passionate appeal and must have seen and understood the means she was using to win the wanderer's love her anger was terrible she had suffered enough secret shame already in stooping to the use of her arts in such a course it had cost her one of the greatest struggles of her life and her disappointment at the result had been proportionately bitter in that alone she had endured almost as much pain as she could bear but to find suddenly that her humiliation her hot speech her failure the look which she knew had been on her face until the moment when the wanderer awoke that all this had been seen and heard by israel kafka was intolerable even keyork's unexpected appearance could not have so fired her wrath keyork might laugh at her afterwards but her failure would have been no triumph to him was not keyork enlisted on her side ready to help her at all times by word or deed in accordance with the terms of their agreement but of all men kafka whom she had so wronged was the one man who should have been ignorant of her defeat and miserable shame go she cried with a gesture of command her eyes flashed and her extended hand trembled there was such concentrated fury in a single word that the wanderer started in surprise ignorant as he was of the true state of things you are uselessly unkind he said gravely the poor man is mad let me take him away leave him to me she answered imperiously he will obey me but israel kafka did not turn he rested one hand upon the slab and faced her as when many different forces act together at one point producing after the first shock a resultant little expected so the many passions that were at work in his face finally twisted his lips into a smile yes he said in a low tone which did not express submission leave me to her leave me to the witch and to her mercy it will be the end of this time she is drunk with her love of you and mad with her hatred of me unorna grew suddenly pale and would have again sprung forward but the wanderer stopped her and held her arm at the same time he looked into kafka's eyes and raised one hand as though in warning be silent he exclaimed and if i speak what then asked the moravian with his evil smile i will silence you answered the wanderer coldly your madness excuses you perhaps but it does not justify me in allowing you to insult a woman kafka's anger took a new direction even madmen are often calmed by the quiet opposition of a strong and self-possessed man and kafka was not mad he was no coward either but the subtlety of his race was in him as oil dropped by the board in a wild tempest does not calm the waves but momentarily prevents their angry crest from breaking so the israelite's quick tact veiled the rough face of his dangerous humour i insult no one he said almost differentially least of all her whom i have worshipped long and lost at last you accuse me unjustly of that and though my speech may have been somewhat rude yet may i be forgiven for the sake of what i have suffered for i have suffered much seeing that he was taking a more courteous tone the wanderer folded his arms and left unorna free to move awaiting her commands or the further development of events he saw in her face that her anger was not subsiding 
and he wondered less at it after hearing Kafka's insulting speech. It was a pity, he thought, that anyone should take so seriously a maniac's words, but he was nevertheless resolved that they should not be repeated. After all, it would be an easy matter, if the man again overstepped the bounds of gentle speech, to take him bodily away from Anona's presence. "'Are you going to charm our ears with a story of your sufferings?' Anona asked, in a tone so cruel that the wanderer expected a quick outburst of anger from Kafka in reply. But he was disappointed in this. The smile still lingered on the Moravian's face when he answered, and his expressive voice, no longer choking with passion, grew very soft and musical. "'It is not mine to charm,' he said. "'It is not given to me to make slaves of all living things with hand and eye and word. Such power nature does not give to all. She has given none to me. I have no spell to win Anorna's love, and if I had, I cannot say that I would take a love thus earned.' He paused a moment, and Unorna grew paler. She started, but then did not move again. His words had power to wound her, but she trembled, lest the wanderer should understand their hidden meaning, and she was silent, biding her time and curbing her passion. No, continued Kafka, I was not thus favored in my nativity. The star of love was not in the ascendant, the lord of magic charms was not trembling upon my horizon. The sun of earthly happiness was not enthroned in my mid-heaven. How could it be? She had it all, this Unorna here, and nature, generous in her one mad moment, lavished upon her all here was to give. For she has all, and we have nothing, as I have learned, and you will learn before you die. He looked at the wanderer as he spoke. His hollow eye seemed calm enough, and in this dejected attitude and subdued tone there was nothing that gave warning of a coming storm. The wanderer listened, half interested and yet half annoyed by his persistence. Unorna herself was silent still. The nightingale was singing on that night, continued Kafka. It was a dewy night in early spring, and the air was very soft when Unorna first breathed it. The world was not asleep, but dreaming, when her eyes first opened to look upon it. Heaven had put on all its glories. Across its silent breast was bound the milk-white ribbon. Its crest was crowned with God's crown jewels, great northern stars. Its mighty form was robed in the mantle of majesty, set with the diamonds of suns and worlds, great and small far and near. Not one tiny spark of all the myriad million gems was darkened by a breath of wind-blown mist. The earth was very still, all wrapped in peace and lulled in love. The great trees pointed their dark spires upwards from the temple of the forest to the firmament of the greater temple on high. In the starlight the year's first roses breathed out the perfume gathered from the departed sun, and every dewdrop in the short sweet grass caught in its little self the reflection of heaven's vast glory. Only in the universal stillness the nightingale sang the song of songs and bound the angel of love with the chains of her linked melody and made him captive in bonds stronger than his own. Israel Kafka spoke dreamily, resting against the stone beside him, seemingly little conscious of the words that fell in oriental imagery from his lips. In other days, Unorna had heard him speak like this to her, and she had loved the speech, though not the man, and sometimes, for its sake, she had wished her heart could find its fellow in his. And even now, the tone and the words had a momentary effect upon her. What would have sounded as folly, overwrought, sentimental, almost laughable, perhaps, to other women, found an echo in her own childish memories, and a sympathy in her belief in her own mysterious nature. The wonder had heard men talk as Israel Kafka talked, and other lands where speech is prized by men and women, not for its tough strength, but for its wealth of flowers. 
and love was her first captive said the moravian and her first slave yes i will tell you the story of unorna's life she is angry with me now well let it be it is my fault or hers what matter she cannot quite forget me out of mind and i has lucifer forgotten god he sighed and a momentary light flashed in his eyes something in the blasphemous strength of the words attracted the wanderer's attention utterly indifferent himself he saw that there was something more than madness in the man before him he found himself wondering what encouragement unorna had given the seed of passion that it should have grown to such strength and he traced the madness back to the love instead of referring the love to the madness but he said nothing so she was born continued kafka dreaming on she was born amid the perfume of the roses under the starlight when the nightingale was singing and all things that lived loved her and submitted to her voice and hand and to her eyes and to her unspoken will as running water follows the course men give it winding and gliding falling and rushing full often of a roar of resistance that covers the deep quick moving stream flowing in spite of itself through the channel that is dug for it to the determined end and nothing resisted her neither man nor woman nor child had any strength to oppose against her magic the wolf hounds licked her feet the wolves themselves crouched fawning in her path for she is without fear as she is without mercy is that strange what fear can there be for her who has the magic charm who holds sleep in the one hand and death in the other and between whose brows is set the knowledge of what shall be hereafter can any one harm her has any one the strength to harm her is there anything on earth which she covets and which shall not be hers though his voice was almost as soft as before the evil smile flickered again about his drawn lips as he looked into unorna's face he wondered why she did not face him and crush him and force him to sleep with her eyes as he knew she could do but he himself was past fear he had suffered too much and cared not what chanced to him now but she should know that he knew all if he should tell her so with his latest breath despair had given him a strange control of his anger and of his words and jealousy had taught him the art of wounding swiftly surely and with a light touch sooner or later she would turn upon him and annihilate him in a dream of unconsciousness he knew that and he knew that such faint power of resisting her as he had ever possessed was gone but so long as she was willing to listen to him so long would he torture her with the sting of her own shame and when her patience ended or her caprice changed he would find some bitter word to cast at her in the moment before losing his consciousness of thought and his power to speak this one chance of wounding was given to him and he would use it to the utmost with all subtlety with all cruelty with all determination to torture whatsoever she covets is hers to take no one escapes the spell in the end no one resists the charm and yet it is written in the book of her fate that she shall one day taste the fruit of ashes and drink of the bitter water it is written that whoever slays with the sword shall die by the sword also she has killed with love and by love she shall perish i loved her once i know what i am saying again he paused lingering thoughtfully upon the words the wanderer glanced at unorna as though asking her whether he should not put a sudden end to the strange monologue she was pale and her eyes were bright but she shook her head let him say what he will say she answered taking the question as though it had been spoken let him say all he will perhaps it is the last time and so you give me your gracious leave to speak said israel kafka and you will let me say all that it is in my heart to say to you before this other man and then you will make an end of me 
I see. I accept the offer. I can even thank you for your patience. You are kind today. I have known you harder. Well, then I will speak out. I will tell my story, not that anyone may judge between you and me. There is neither judge nor justice for those who love in vain. So I loved you. That is the whole story. Do you understand me, sir? I loved this woman, but she would not love me. That is all. And what of it? And what then? Look at her, and look at me. The beginning, and the end. In a manner familiar to Orientals, the unhappy man laid one finger upon his own breast, and with the other hand pointed at Unorna's fair young face. The wanderer's eyes obeyed at the guiding gesture, and he looked from one to the other, and again the belief crossed his thoughts that there was less of madness about Israel Kafka than Keyork would have had him think. Trying to read the truth from Unorna's eyes, he saw that they avoided his, and he fancied they detected symptoms of distress in her pallor and contracted lips. And yet, he argued, that if it were all true she would silence the speaker, and that the only reason for her patience must be sought in her willingness to humor the diseased brain in its wanderings. In either case, he pitied Israel Kafka profoundly, and his compassion increased from one moment to another. I loved her. There is a history in those three words which neither the eloquent tongue nor the skilled pen can tell. See how coldly I speak. I command my speech. I may pick and choose among ten thousand words and phrases and describe love at my leisure. She grants me time. She is very merciful today. What would you have me say? You know what love is. Think of such love as yours can have been and take that and three times over and a hundred thousand times and cram it burning flaming melting into your bursting heart then you would know a tenth of what i have known love indeed who can have known love but me i stand alone since the dull unlovely world first jarred and trembled and began to move there has not been another of my kind nor has man suffered as i have suffered and been crushed and torn and thrown aside to die without even the mercy of a death wound describe it tell it look at me i am both love's description and the epitaph on his gravestone in me he lived me he tortured with me he dies never to live again as he has lived this once there is no justice and no mercy Think not that it is enough to love and that you will be loved in return. Do not think that. Do not dream that. Do you not know that the fiercest drought is as a spring rain to the rocks, which thirst not and need no refreshment? Again he fixed his eyes on Unorna's face and faintly smiled. Apparently she was displeased. What is it that you would say? she asked coldly. What is this that you tell us of rocks and rain and death wounds and the rest? You say you loved me once. That was a madness. You say that I never loved you. That, at least, is truth. Is that your story? It is indeed short enough, and I marvel at the many words in which you have put so little she laughed in a hard tone but israel kafka's eyes grew dark and the somber fire beamed in them as he spoke again the weary tortured smile left his wan lips and his pale face grew stern laugh laugh unorna he cried you do not laugh alone and yet i love you still i love you so well in spite of all that i cannot laugh at you as i would even though i were to see you again clinging to the rock and imploring it to take pity on your thirst and he who dies for you anorna of him you ask nothing save that he will crawl away and die alone and not disturb your delicate life with such an unseemly sight you talk of death exclaimed anorna scornfully you talk of dying for me because you are ill to-day 
to mark york arabian will have carried you and then for aught i know you will talk of killing me instead this is child's talk boy's talk if we are to listen to you you must be more eloquent you must give us such a tale of woe as shall draw tears from our eyes and sobs from our breast then we will applaud you and let you go that shall be your reward the wanderer glanced at her in surprise there was a bitterness in her tone of which he had not believed her soft voice capable why do you hate him so if he is mad he asked the reason is not far to seek said kafka this woman here god made her crooked-hearted love her and she will hate you as only she has learned how to hate show her that cold face of yours and she will love you so that she will make a carpet of her pride for you to walk on ay or spit on either if you deign to be so kind she has a wonderful kind of heart for it freezes when you burn it and melts when you freeze it are you mad indeed asked the wanderer suddenly planting himself in front of kafka they told me so i can almost believe it no i am not mad yet answered the younger man facing him fearlessly you need not come between me and her she can protect herself you would know that if you knew what i saw her do with you first when i came here what did she do the wanderer turned quickly as he stood and looked at unorna do not listen to his ravings she said the word seemed weak and poorly chosen and there was a strange look in her face as though she were either afraid or desperate or both she loves you said israel kafka calmly and you do not know it she has power over you as she has over me but the power to make you love her she has not she will destroy you and your state shall be no better than mine to-day we shall have moved on a step for i shall be dead and you will be the madman and she will have found another to love and to torture the world is full of them her altar will never lack sacrifices the wanderer's face was grave you may be mad or not he said i cannot tell but you say monstrous things and you shall not repeat them did she not say that i might speak asked kafka with a bitter laugh i will keep my word said unorna you seek your own destruction find it in your own way it will not be the less sure speak say what you will you shall not be interrupted the wanderer drew back not understanding what was passing nor why unorna was so long suffering say all you have to say she repeated coming forward so that she stood directly in front of israel kafka and you she added speaking to the wanderer leave him to me he is quite right i can protect myself if i need any protection you remember how we parted unorna said kafka it is a month to-day i did not expect a greeting of you when i came back or if i did expect it it was foolish and unthinking i should have known you better i should have known that there is one half of your word which you never break the cruel half and the one thing which you cannot forgive and which is my love for you and yet that is the very thing which i cannot forget i have come back to tell you so you may as well know it unorna's expression grew cold as she saw that he abandoned the strain of reproach and spoke once more of his love for her yes i see what you mean he said very quietly you mean to show me by your face that you give me no hope i should have known that by other things i have seen here god knows i have seen enough but i meant to find you alone i went to your home i saw you go out i followed you i entered here i heard all and I understood for i know your power as this man cannot know it do you wonder that i followed you do you despise me do you think i still care because you do love is stronger than the woman loved 
and for her we do deeds of baseness unblushingly which she would forbid our doing and for which she despises us when she hates us and loves us all the more dearly when she loves us at all you hate me then despise me too if you will it is too late to care i followed you like a spy i saw what i expected to see i have suffered what i knew i should suffer you know that i have been away during this whole month and that i have travelled thousands of leagues in the hope of forgetting you and yet i fancied i had seen you within the month unorna said with a cruel smile they say that ghosts haunt the places they have loved answered kafka unmoved if that be true i may have troubled your dreams and you may have seen me i have come back broken in body and in heart i think i have come back to die here the life is going out of me but before it is quite gone i can say two things i can tell you that i know you at last and that in spite of the horror of knowing what you are i love you still am i so very horrible she asked scornfully you know what you are better than i can tell you but not better than i know i know even the secret meaning of your moods and caprices i know why you are willing to listen to me this last time so patiently with only now and then a sneer and a cutting laugh why in order to make me suffer the more you will never forgive me now for you know that i know and that alone is a sin past all forgiveness and over and above that i am guilty of the crime of loving you when you have no love for me and as a last resource you come to me and recapitulate your misdeeds the plan is certainly original though it lacks wit there is least wit where there is most love unorna i take no account of the height of my folly when i see the depth of my love which has swallowed up myself and all my life in the last hour i have known its depth and breadth and strength for i have seen what it can bear and why should i complain of it have i not many times said that i would die for you willingly and is it not dying for you to die of love for you to prove my faith it were too easy a death when i look into your face i know that there is in me the heart that made true christian martyrs unorna laughed would you be a martyr she asked not for your faith but for the faith i once had in you and for the love that no martyrdom could kill i to prove that love i would die a hundred deaths and to gain yours i would die the death eternal and you would have deserved it have you not deserved enough already enough of martyrdom for tracking me to-day for following me stealthily like a thief and a spy to find out my ends and my doings i love you unorna and therefore you suspect me of unimaginable evil and therefore you come out of your hiding-place and accuse me of things i have neither done nor thought of doing building up falsehood upon lie and lie upon falsehood in the attempt to ruin me in the eyes of one who has my friendship and who is my friend you are foolish to throw yourself upon my mercy israel kafka foolish yes and mad too and my madness is all you have left me take it it is yours you cannot kill my love deny my words deny your deeds let all be false in you it is but one pain more and my heart is not broken yet it will bear another tell me that what i saw had no reality that you did not make him sleep here on this spot before my eyes that you did not pour your love into his sleeping ears that you did not command implore entreat and fail what is it all to me whether you speak truth or not 
tell me it is not true that i would die a thousand martyrdoms for your sake as you are and if you were a thousand times worse than you are your right your wrong your truth your falsehood you yourself are swallowed up in the love i bear you i love you always and i will say it and say it again your eyes i love them too take me into them unorna whether in hate or love but in love yes love unorna golden unorna with a cry on his lips the name he had given her in other days he made one mad step forwards throwing out his arms as though to clasp her to him but it was too late even while he had been speaking her mysterious influence had overpowered him as he had known that it would when she so pleased she caught his two hands in the air and pressed him back and held him against the tall slab the whole pitilessness of her nature gleamed like a cold light in her white face there was a martyr of your race once she said in cruel tones his name was simon abellus you talk of martyrdom you shall know what it means though it be too good for you who spy upon the woman whom you say you love the hectic flush of passion sank from israel kafka's cheek rigid with outstretched arms and bent head he stood against the ancient gravestone above him as though raised to heaven in silent supplication were the sculptured hands that marked the last resting place of a cone you shall know now said unorna you shall suffer indeed end of fourteen recording by angelique g campbell or burgundy grace at gmail dot com july two thousand eighteen Chapter 15 of The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angelique G. Campbell, July 2018. The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale by Francis Marion Crawford the deeds here described were done in prague on the twenty-first day of february in the year sixteen ninety four lazarus and his accomplice levi kurtzendahl or brevimanus or the short-handed were betrayed by their own people lazarus hanged himself in prison and levi suffered death by the wheel repentant it is said and himself baptized a full account of the trial written in latin was printed and a copy of it may be seen in the state museum in prague the body of simon abellus was exhumed and rest in the teen carache in the chapel on the left of the high altar the slight extension of certain scenes not fully described in the latin volume will be pardoned in a work of fiction Unorna's voice sank from the tone of anger to a lower pitch. She spoke quietly and very distinctly, as though to impress every word upon the ear of the man who was in her power. The wanderer listened, too, scarcely comprehending at first, but slowly yielding to the influence she exerted, until the vision rose before him also, with all its moving scenes, in all its truth, and in all its horror as in a dream the deeds that had been passed before him the desolate burial ground was peopled with forms and faces of other days the gravestones rose from the earth and piled themselves into gloomy houses and remote courts and dim streets and venerable churches the dry and twisted trees shrank down and broadened and swung their branches as arms and drew up their roots out of the ground as feet under them and moved hither and thither and the knots and the bosses and gnarls upon them became faces dark eagle-like and keen and the creaking and crackling of the boughs and twigs under the piercing blast that swept by became articulate like the voices of old men talking angrily together 
There were sudden changes from day to night and from night to day. In dark chambers, crouching men took counsel of blood together under the feeble rays of the flickering lamp. In the uncertain twilight of winter, muffled figures lurked at the corners of streets, waiting for someone to pass who must not escape them. As the wanderer gazed and listened, Israel Kafka was transformed. He no longer stood with outstretched arms, his back against a crumbling slab, his filmy eyes fixed on Unorna's face. He grew younger. His features were those of a boy of scarcely thirteen years, pale, earnest, and brightened by a soft light which followed him hither and thither. And he was not alone. He moved with others through the old familiar streets of the city, clothed in a fashion of other times, speaking in accents comprehensible, but unlike the speech of today, acting in a dim and far-off light that had once been. The wanderer looked, and, as in dreams, he knew that what he saw was unreal. He knew that the changing walls and streets and houses and public places were built up of gravestones, which in truth were deeply planted in the ground, immovable and incapable of spontaneous motion. He knew that the crowds of men and women were not human beings, but gnarled and twisted trees rooted in the earth, and that the hum of voices which reached his ears was but the sound of dried branches bending in the wind. He knew that Israel Kafka was not the pale-faced boy who glided from place to place, followed everywhere by a soft radiance. He knew that Onorna was the source and origin of the vision, and that the mingling speeches of the actors, now shrill in angry altercation, now hissing in low, fierce whisper, were really formed upon Onorna's lips and made audible through her tones as the chorus of indistinct speech proceeded from the swaying trees. It was to him but an illusion of which he understood the key and penetrated the secret, but it was marvelous in its way and he was held enthralled from the first moment when it began to unfold itself. He understood further that Israel Kafka was in a state different from this, that he was suffering all the reality of another life, which to the wanderer was but a dream. For the moment all his faculties had a double perception of things and sounds, distinguishing clearly between the fact and the mirage that distorted and obscured it, for the moment he was aware that his reason was awake, though his eyes and his ears might be sleeping. Then the unequal contest between the senses and the intellect ceased, and while still retaining the dim consciousness that the source of all he saw and heard lay in Unorna's brain, he allowed himself to be led quickly from one scene to another, absorbed and taken out of himself by the horror of the deeds done before him. At first, indeed, the vision, though vivid, seemed objectless and of uncertain meaning. The dark depths of the Jews' quarters of the city were open, and it was towards evening. Throngs of gowned men, crooked, bearded, filthy, vulture-eyed, crowded upon each other in a narrow public place, talking in quick, shrill accents, gesticulating with hands and arms and heads and bodies, laughing, chuckling, chattering, hooked-nosed and loose-lipped, grasping fat purses and lean fingers, shaking greasy curls that straggled out under caps of greasy fur, glancing to right and left with quick, gleaming looks that pierced the gloom like fitful flashes of lightning, plucking at each other by the sleeve and pointing long fingers and crooked nails, two, three, and four at a time, as markers in their ready reckoning, a writhing mass of humanity, intoxicated by the smell of gold, mad for its possession, half hysteric with the fear of losing it, timid yet dangerous, poisoned to the core by the sweet sting of money, terrible in intelligence, vile in heart, contemptible in body, irresistible in the unity of their greed. The Jews of Prague, two hundred years ago. In one corner of the dusky place there was a little light. A boy stood there beside a veiled woman, and the light that seemed to cling about him was not the reflection of gold. He was very young. His pale face had in it all the lost beauty of the Jewish race. His lips were clearly cut, even, 
pure in outline and firm the forehead was broad with thought the features noble aquiline not vulture-like such a face might holy stephen deacon and proto-martyr have turned upon the young men who laid their garments at the feet of the unconverted saul he stood there looking on at the scene in the market-place not wondering for nothing of it was new to him not scorning for he felt no hate nor wrathful for he dreamed of peace he would have had it otherwise that was all he would have had the stream flow back upon its source and take a new channel for itself he would have seen the strength of his people wielded in cleaner deeds for nobler aims the gold he hated the race for it he despised the poison of it he loathed but he had neither loathing nor contempt nor hatred for the men themselves he looked upon them and he loved to think that the carrion vulture might once again be purified and lifted on strong wings and become as in old days the eagle of the mountains for many minutes he gazed in silence then he sighed and turned away he held certain books in his hands for he had come from the school of the synagogue where throughout the short winter days the rabbis taught him and his companions the mysteries of the sacred tongue the woman by his side was a servant in his father's house and it was her duty to attend him through the streets until the day when being judged a man he should be suddenly freed from the bondage of childish things let us go he said in a low voice the air is full of gold and heavy i cannot breathe it whither asked the woman thou knowest he answered and suddenly the faint radiance that was always about him grew brighter and spread out arms behind him to the right and left in the figure of a cross they walked together side by side quickly and often glancing behind them as though to see whether they were followed and yet it seemed as though it was not they who moved but the city about them which changed the throng of busy jews grew shadowy and disappeared their shrill voices were lost in the distance there were other people in the street of other features and in different garbs of prouder bearing and hot restless manner broad-shouldered erect manly with spur on heel and sword at side the outline of the old synagogue melted into the murky air and changed its shape and stood out again in other and ever-changing forms now they were passing before the walls of a noble palace now beneath low long galleries of arches now again across the open space of the great ring in the midst of the city then all at once they were standing before the richly carved doorway of the teen carache the very doorway out of which the wanderer had followed the fleeting shadow of beatrice's figure but a month ago and they paused and looked again to the right and left and searched the dark corners with piercing glances thy life is in thine hand said the woman speaking close to the boy's ear it is yet time turn with me and let us go back the mysterious radiance lit up the youth's beautiful face in the dark street and showed the fearless yet gentle smile that was on his lips what is there to fear he asked death answered the woman in a trembling tone they will kill thee and it shall be upon my head and what is death he asked again and the smile was still upon his face as he led the way up the steps the woman bowed her head and drew her veil more closely about her and followed him then they were within a church darker more ghostly less rich in those days than now the boy stood beside the hewn stone basin wherein was the blessed water and he touched the frozen surface with his fingers and held them out to his companion is it thus he asked and the heavenly smile grew more radiant as he made the sign of the cross again the woman inclined her head be it not upon me she exclaimed earnestly 
though I would it might be for ever so with thee. It is for ever, the boy answered. He went forward and prostrated himself before the high altar, and the soft light hovered above him. The woman knelt at a little distance from him, with clasped hands and upturned eyes. The church was very dark and silent. An old man in a monk's robe came forward out of the shadow of the choir, and stood behind the marble rails and looked down at the boy's prostrate figure, wonderingly. Then the low gateway was opened, and he descended the three steps and bent down to the young head. What wouldst thou? he asked. Simon Abellus rose until he knelt and looked up into the old man's face. I am a Jew. I would be a Christian. I would be baptized. Fearest thou not thy people? the monk asked. I fear not death, answered the boy simply. Come with me. Trembling, the woman followed them both, and all were lost in the gloom of the church. They were not to be seen, and all was still for a space. Suddenly, a clear voice broke the silence. Ego baptizo terra nomine e petrus e filae e spirito sancti. Then the woman and boy were standing again without the entrance in the chilly air and the ancient monk was upon the threshold under the carved arch. His thin hands, white in the darkness, were lifted high, and he blessed them, and they went their way. In the moving vision the radiance was brighter still, and illuminated the streets as they moved on. Then a cloud descended over all, and certain days and weeks passed, and again the boy was walking swiftly toward the church. But the woman was not with him, and he believed that he was alone, though the messengers of evil were upon him. Two dark figures moved in the shadow, silent, noiseless in their walk, muffled in long garments. He went on, no longer deigning to look back, beyond fear as he had ever been, and beyond even the expectation of a danger. He went into the church, and the two men made gestures and spoke in low tones, and hid themselves in the shade of the buttresses outside. The vision grew darker, and a terrible stillness was over everything, for the church was not opened to the sight at this time. There was a horror of long waiting with the certainty of what was to come. The narrow street was empty to the eye, and yet there was the knowledge of evil presence of two strong men waiting in the dark to take their victim to the place of expiation, and the horror grew in the silence and the emptiness until it was unbearable. The door opened, and the boy was with the monk under the black arch. The old man embraced him and blessed him and stood still for a moment, watching him as he went down. Then he, also, turned and went back, and the door was closed. Swiftly the two men glided from their hiding place and sped among the uneven pavement. The boy paused and faced them, for he felt that he was taken. They grasped him by the arms on each side, Lazarus his father, and Levi, surnamed the short-handed, the strongest and the cruelest and the most relentless of the younger rabbis. Their grip was rough, and the older man held a coarse woolen cloth in his hand with which to smother the boy's cries if he should call out for help. But he was very calm, and did not resist them. "'What wouldst thou?' he asked. "'And what dost thou in a Christian church?' asked Lazarus in low, fierce tones. "'What Christians do, since I am one of them,' answered the youth, unmoved. Lazarus said nothing, but he struck the boy on the mouth with his hard hand so that the blood ran down. Not here, exclaimed Levi, anxiously looking about, and they hurried him away through dark and narrow lanes. He opposed no resistance to Levi's rough strength, not only suffering himself to be dragged along, but doing his best to keep pace with the man's long strides nor did he murmur at the blows and thrust dealt him from time to time by his father from the other side. During some minutes they were still traversing the Christian part of the city. 
a single loud cry for help would have brought a rescue a few words to the rescuers would have roused a mob of fierce men and the two jews would have paid with their lives for the deeds they had not yet committed but simon abelus uttered no cry and offered no resistance he had said that he feared not death and he had spoken the truth not knowing what manner of death was to be his onward they sped and in the vision the way they traversed seemed to sweep past them so that they remained always in sight though always hurrying on the christian quarter was passed before them hung the chain of one of those gates which gave access to the city of the jews with a jeer and an oath the bearded sentry watched them pass the martyr and his torturers one word to him even then and the butt of his heavy halberd would have broken levi's arm and laid the boy's father in the dust the word was not spoken on through the filthy ways on and on through narrow courts and tortuous passages to a dark low doorway then again the vision showed but an empty street and there was a silence for a space and a horror of long waiting in the falling night lights moved within the house and then one window after another was bolted and barred from within still the silence endured until the ear was grown used to it and could hear sounds very far off from deep down below the house itself but the walls did not open and the scene did not change a dull noise bad to hear resounded as from beneath a vault and then another and another the sound of cruel blows upon a human body then a pause wilt thou renounce it asked the voice of lazarus kyrie eleison christe eleison came the answer brave and clear lay on levi and let thy arm be strong and again the sounds of blows regular merciless came up from the bowels of the earth dost thou repent dost thou renounce dost thou deny i repent of my sins i renounce your ways i believe in the lord Je the sacred name was not heard a smothered groan as of one losing consciousness in extreme torture was all that came up from below lay on levi lay on nay answered the strong rabbi the boy will die let us leave him here for this night perchance cold and hunger will be more potent than stripes when he shall come to himself as thou sayest answered the father in angry reluctance again all was silent soon the rays of light ceased to shine through the crevices of the outer shutters and sleep descended upon the quarter of the jews still the scene in the vision changed not after a long stillness a clear young voice was heard speaking lord if it be thy will that i die grant that i may bear all in thy name grant that i unworthy may endure in this body the punishments due to me in spirit for my sins and if it be thy will that i live let my life be used also for thy glory the voice ceased and the cloud of passing time descended upon the vision and was lifted again and again and each time the same voice was heard and the sound of torturing blows but the voice of the boy was weaker every night though it was not less brave i believe it said always do what you will you have power over the body but i have the faith over which you have no power so the days and nights passed and though the prayer came up in feeble tones it was born of a mighty spirit and it rang in the ears of the tormentors as the voice of an angel which they had no power to silence appealing from them to the tribunal of the throne of god most high day by day also the rabbis and the elders began to congregate together at evening before the house of lazarus 
and to talk with him and with each other debating how they might break the endurance of his son and bring him again into the synagogue as one of themselves chief among them in their councils was levi the short-handed devising new tortures for the frail body to bear and boasting how he would conquer the stubborn boy by the might of his hands to heart some of the rabbis shook their heads he is possessed of a devil they said he will die and repent not but others nodded approvingly and wagged their filthy heads and said that when the fool had been chastised the evil spirit would depart from him once more the cloud of passing time descended and was lifted then the walls of the house were opened and in a low arched chamber the rabbi sat about a black table it was night and a single smoking lamp was lighted a mere wick projecting out of a three-cornered vessel of copper which was full of oil and was hung from the vault with blackened wires seven rabbis sat at the board and at the head sat lazarus their crooked hands and claw-like nails moved uneasily and there was a lurid fire in their vultures eyes they bent forward speaking to each other in low tones and from beneath their greasy caps their anointed side curls dangled and swung as they moved their heads but levi the short-handed was not among them their muffled talk was interrupted from time to time by the sound of sharp loud blows as of a hammer striking upon nails as though a carpenter were at work not far from the room in which they sat he has not repented said lazarus from his place neither many stripes nor cold nor hunger nor thirst have moved him to righteousness it is written that he shall be cut off from his people he shall be cut off answered the rabbis with one voice it is right and just that he should die continued the father shall we give him over to the christians that he may dwell among them and become one of them and be shown before the world to our shame we will not let him go said the dark man and an evil smile flickered from one face to another as a firefly flutters from tree to tree in the night as though the spirit of evil had touched each one in turn we will not let him go said each again lazarus also smiled as though in assent and bowed his head a little before he spoke i am obedient to your judgment it is yours to command and mine to obey if you say that he must die let him die he is my son take him did not our father abraham lay isaac upon the altar and offer him as a burnt sacrifice before the lord let him die said the rabbis then let him die answered lazarus i am your servant it is mine to obey his blood be on our heads they said and again the evil smile went round it is then expedient that we determine of what manner his death shall be continued the father inclining his body to signify his submission it is not lawful to shed his blood said the rabbis and we cannot stone him lest we be brought to judgment of the christians determine now the manner of his death my masters if you will it let him be brought once more before us let us all hear with our ears his denial and if he repent at the last it is well let him live but if he harden his heart against our entreaties let him die levi hath brought certain pieces of wood hither to my house and is even now at work if the youth is still stubborn in his unbelief let him die even as the unbeliever died by the righteous judgment of the romans let it be so let him be crucified said the rabbis with one voice then lazarus rose and went out and in the vision the rabbis remained seated motionless in their places awaiting his return the noise of levi's hammer echoed through the low vaulted chamber 
and at each blow the smoking lamp quivered a little, casting strange shadows upon the evil faces beneath its light. At last footsteps, slow and uncertain, were heard without. The low door opened, and Lazarus entered, holding up the body of his son before him. "'I have brought him before you for the last time,' he said. "'Question him, and hear his condemnation out of his own mouth. "'He repents not, though I have done my utmost to bring him back to the paths of righteousness. "'Question him, my masters, and let us see what he will say.' "'White and exhausted with long hunger and thirst, his body broken by torture,' scarcely any longer sensible to bodily pain simon abellus would have fallen to the ground had his father not held him under the arms his head hung forward and the pale and noble face was inclined toward the breast with the deep dark eyes were open and gazed calmly upon those who sat in judgment at the table a rough piece of linen cloth was wrapped about the boy's shoulders and body but his thin arms were bare Hearest thou, Simon, son of Lazarus, asked the rabbis, knowest thou in whose presence thou standest? I hear you, and I know you all. There was no fear in the voice, though it trembled from weakness. Renounce then thy errors, and having suffered the chastisement of thy folly, return to the ways of thy father and of thy father's house and of all thy people. I renounce my sins, and whatsoever is yet left for me to suffer, I will, by God's help, so bear it as to not be unworthy of Christ's mercy. The rabbis gazed at the brave young face and smiled and wagged their beards talking to one another in low tones. It is as we feared, they said. He is unrepentant and he is worthy of death. It is not expedient that the young adder should live. There is poison under his tongue, and he speaks things not lawful for an Israelite to hear. Let him die, that we may see him no more, and that our children be not corrupted by his false teachings. Hearest thou? Thou shalt die. It was Lazarus who spoke while holding up the boy before the table and hissing the words into his ear. I hear. I am ready. Lead me forth. There is yet time to repent. If thou wilt but deny what thou hast said these many days and return to us, thou shalt be forgiven, and thy days shall be long among us, and thy children's days after thee and the lord shall perchance to have mercy and increase thy goods among thy fellows let him alone said the rabbis he is unrepentant lead me forth said simon abellus lead him forth repeated the rabbis perchance when he sees the manner of his death before his eyes he will repent at the last the boy's fearless eyes looked from one to the other whatsoever it be he said i have but one life take it as you will i die in the faith of the lord jesus christ and into his hands i commend my spirit which you cannot take lead him forth let him be crucified cried the rabbis together we will hear him no longer then Lazarus led his son away from them and left them talking together and shaking their heads and wagging their filthy beards. And in the vision the scene changed. The chamber with its flickering lamp and its black table and all the men who were in it grew dim and faded away. And in its place there was a dim inner court between high houses upon which only the windows of the house of Lazarus opened. There, Upon the ground stood a lantern of horn, and the soft yellow light of it fell upon two pieces of wood, nailed one upon the other to form a small cross, small indeed, and yet tall enough and broad enough and strong enough to bear the slight burden of the boy's frail body, 
and beside it stood lazarus and levi the short-handed the strong rabbi holding simon and Bellus between them on the ground lay pieces of cord ready wherewith to bind him to the cross for they held it unlawful to shed his blood it was soon done the two men took up the cross and set it with the body hanging thereon upon the wall of the narrow court over against the house of lazarus thou mayest still repent during this night said the father holding up the horn lantern and looking into his son's tortured face ay there is yet time said levi brutally he will not die so soon lord into thy hands i commend my spirit said the weak voice once more then lazarus raised his hand and struck him once more on the mouth as he had done on that first night when he had seized him near the church but levi the short-handed as though in wrath at seeing all his torments fail dealt him one heavy blow just where the ear joins the neck and it was over at last a radiant smile of peace flickered over the pale face the eyelids quivered and closed the head fell forward upon the breast and the martyrdom of simon abellus was consummated into the dark court came the rabbis one by one from the inner chamber and each as he came took up the horn lantern and held it to the dead face and smiled and spoke a few low words in the hebrew tongue and then went out into the street until only lazarus and levi were left alone with the dead body then they debated what they should do and for a time they went into the house and refreshed themselves with food and wine and comforted each other well knowing that they had done an evil deed and they came back when it was late and wrapped the body in the coarse cloth and carried it out stealthily and buried it in the jewish cemetery and departed again to their own houses and there he lay said unorna the boy of your race who was faithful to death have you suffered have you for one short hour known the meaning of such great words as you dared to speak to me do you now know what it means to be a martyr to suffer for standing on the very spot where he lay you have felt in some small degree a part of what he must have felt you live be warned if again you anger me your life shall not be spared you the visions had all vanished again the wilderness of grave stones and lean crooked trees appeared wild and desolate as before the wanderer roused himself and saw unorna standing before israel kafka's prostrate body as though suddenly released from a spell he sprang forward and knelt down trying to revive the unconscious man by rubbing his hands and chafing his temples end of chapter fifteen of the witch of prague a fantastic tale recording by angelique g campbell or burgundy grace at gmail dot com